A movie based on a popular toy line is a rite of passage for every generation of kids, and for the executives in charge of maintaining that brand. Refresh all the consumables so the sales cycle can continue while giving kids a taste of the real world as they watch their heroes achieve modern artistic legitimacy that simultaneously destroys their childhood. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie. Thank you to Bosley for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below to get your free information kit and a $250 off Bosley gift card today. Bosley is America's number one hair restoration experts with more than 45 years of experience and has performed over 430,000 hair restoration procedures. Millions of men and women have come to Bosley for their answers to their hair loss and hair restoration questions. Bosley offers the latest hair restoration technology and one-day procedures for both surgical and non-surgical solutions. Whether you're just starting research or you've been thinking about making a change for a while, Bosley has the solution. Bosley offers a free information kit, everything you want to know about hair loss and hair restoration options. Bosley has more than 70 locations across the U.S., but can also deliver solutions straight to your doorstep. They offer free in-person and video consultations. Find out what solution is right for you by visiting bosley.com. The sooner you take action, the more options you have. Learn how you can get a fuller, thicker head of hair by going to bosley.com slash toygalaxy, or click the link below to get your free information kit and a $250 off Bosley gift card. You can get a free cost estimate and find the right solution for you. That's bosley.com slash toygalaxy. And thank you again to Bosley. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie was released on June 30th, 1995, just two years after the premiere of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers television show on Fox Kids in the U.S. The movie served as a transition not only for the narrative of the story in their world, but also for the brand in our world. From a franchise with box office aspirations to a franchise with box office regrets. Angel Grove, a bustling California metropolis, is home to Earth's most powerful superheroes, the Power Rangers. Six teenagers handpicked by the noble Zordon for their talents, their compassion, and, most importantly, their attitude. It is in this otherwise normal city that an ancient artifact is accidentally unearthed by construction workers, a giant foreboding egg that is immediately hatched by regular series villains Rita Repulsa and Lord Zed. A new nemesis, Ivan Ooze, is released from a 6,000-year imprisonment, having been trapped there by the same Zordon responsible for the creation of the Power Rangers. With revenge at the top of his list, Ivan replaces Lord Zed and Rita as top bad guy, accomplishing precisely what they had not been able to accomplish in the years before. Destroy the Power Rangers Command Center, defeat Zordon, take away the Rangers' powers, and cast them deep into space. Now the Power Rangers must take on a new adventure, travel to a strange new world, meet new people, and fight monsters to acquire an even greater power. Time is running out to defeat Ivan Ooze, to save Zordon, to save Angel Grove, to save the world. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers first aired in August of 1993, produced by Saban Entertainment for Fox Kids Television. It utilized a familiar process, licensing a previously existing Japanese television series, then taking steps to localize it for broadcast in the U.S. as though it were a wholly original production. Using action scenes from the 1992 Toei Super Sentai series Kyoryu Sentai Ju Ranger, intercut with original footage featuring American actors and all new storylines, Saban and Fox scored a huge hit that moved billions of dollars in merchandise. After running out of Ju Ranger footage, Saban headed back to the well for season two to get more action scenes, robots, monsters, and costumes from subsequent seasons of Super Sentai. Season two in 1994 replaced the Green Ranger and Zords from Ju Ranger with the White Ranger and Zords from 1993's Gosei Sentai Dai Ranger. This would become an annual process, as it had been in Japan since the late 70s, with each season resetting the themes and aesthetic of the narrative with the ultimate intent of driving more toy sales. Season 3 would do the same for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but this time that transition would take place at the movies instead of on television. The Power Rangers franchise had completely reshaped the children's television and merchandise market in just two years. It was time to see if that power could expand to the theater. The feature film was also a bold attempt by Saban to take an even greater degree of control over the Power Rangers franchise by creating the entire thing from scratch. No borrowed Toei footage, further establishing the Power Rangers as a unique American entity independent of Toei's Ju Ranger, costume and robot designs notwithstanding. 
A feature film seems like an obvious next step for a television franchise that was already so successful. But the problem started before a script was in hand. In a move that would have lasting implications for the series and the movie, Saban had taken the unusual cost-cutting measure of producing Mighty Morphin Power Rangers from the beginning as a non-union show. This meant that it was cheaper to produce from a budgetary standpoint, but it also meant little protection and little pay for the cast. Some actors have said they were paid as little as minimum wage at the time and could have made more money working at McDonald's. Three of the five original Rangers, Austin St. John as Red Ranger Jason, Tui Trang as Yellow Ranger Trini, and Walter Jones as Black Ranger Zack, decided that they weren't going to continue to be a part of the series without a renegotiated contract. Preferably one that included fair pay and more, considering that a feature film was going to be added to the production schedule. Their characters were written out of the series, and Saban was forced to recast for the TV series and subsequently the movie. Production officially began in 1994. On the day the new Rangers were cast, Steve Cardenas as the Red Ranger, Karen Ashley as the Yellow Ranger, and Johnny Young Bosch as the Black Ranger. They were told that they were also going to be appearing in the new movie that was going to start shooting immediately in Australia. Saban Entertainment, in conjunction with 20th Century Fox, enlisted producer Suzanne Todd and a team of writers to begin figuring out what a Power Rangers feature film would look like. Writer Arne Olsen, who had developed a reputation for writing children's movies, submitted a pitch that they liked and wanted to build on. With his Power Rangers in Space concept, he wrote a script that was ultimately passed over by Fox in favor of a script written by John Camps, which introduced the new villain Ivan Ooze. That said, elements from both drafts would make the final version as Olsen was brought back to clean up and smooth out the actual shooting script. The most important part of the script was that it reaches out beyond the expected characters and story of the show, and there are several obvious reasons for this. One, new villains and new worlds means that you can do whatever you want with them. Set them up, tear them down, kill them all. Whatever happens to them can stay in the movie whether it gets referred to again or not. Two, sell the toys. New characters, new villains, new weapons, new hero gear. That's what this is all about. New stuff, new toys, new bedsheets, new Tiger Electronics handheld games. Power Rangers, by the nature of its creation, was a Frankenstein entity made of parts and pieces of different productions. Scripts being written over previously existing footage, trying to make disparate elements seem like their juxtaposition was intentional. Over time, a narrative developed. More as a result of the limitations of the ingredients rather than a recipe set about from the beginning. There's nothing wrong with that per se, however in this case, the impact on the movie was the extra degree of restriction it put on the production of the film, again, before it even had a script. Olsen wasn't given much of a choice but to introduce new characters and limit the development of the Rangers themselves because the television series was decreed to be the priority. Olsen couldn't do anything that might conflict with the narrative that had already been written and shot for the series. Meanwhile, Steve Wang was initially recruited to direct. Wang had just directed Guyver Dark Hero, a movie that had a lot in common with the film they were looking to make, a Japanese comic book superhero wearing bio armor that looked like he could be a Power Rangers villain. Wang didn't stick around long though and was replaced by Brian Spicer who wasn't technically working on his first film, but was going to be directing his first film. Spicer had plenty of television directing experience under his belt, including 21 episodes of Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Spicer had never technically watched Power Rangers, not that that was a requirement for directing a movie about them, but to be safe, Spicer did binge watch every episode up to that point to make sure that he had a feel for the aesthetics, the narrative movements, the mise-en-scene. Spicer wanted to bring a higher degree of emotion to his film. He wanted to be able to see the actors' faces as they ninja kicked a giant bird man so hard it turns into a puddle of purple goo, which was good because the costume department was preparing a version of the suits with retractable visors and mouth plates that usually block the actors' face acting. Beyond the new helmets, the new suits were designed with a more substantial armored appearance. All the extra padding made them 30 to 40 pounds heavier than their television counterparts. After an initial round of shooting, Spicer and the rest of the production recognized just how terrible the helmets looked without their visors and mouth plates, how much more difficult it actually made the continuity between actors and stunt people, and decided that the best move was to go ahead and reshoot everything they had already shot. The story called for the Power Rangers to leave Earth in search of a great power, more powerful than the power that they already had as the Power Rangers. The quest brought them to the planet Fados, where they meet up with Dulcea, a great warrior from the tribe that helped battle against Ivan Ooze, imprisoning him in the egg so many years ago. Gabriella Fitzpatrick was cast as Dulcea. After an initial round of shooting, she was diagnosed with an ovarian cyst, something that caused her such extreme pain that she couldn't perform the role. And if you've ever seen the costume, it's not that easy to just swap in a stunt performer. 
Summer. So the part was recast with Mariska Hargitay, who you know today as Detective Olivia Benson on Law & Order SVU. Spicer and company decided that the best move was to go ahead and reshoot everything they had already shot involving Fitzpatrick as Dulcea. And look, movie making is a special thing. It can be magical when all the pieces come together, when everything meshes. They say you make a movie three times, once in the writing, once in the shooting, and once in the editing. The crew of Power Rangers wanted to see if they could beat that record. Each has a gift. Each has a power. Each has a purpose. And together, they will face their greatest adventure. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie. The power is on next summer. A shoot that was supposed to run from October to December was up against its deadline. The production had been so delayed that they were not only going to have to stay in Australia past the holidays, but they were going to have to shoot some of the regular TV series in Australia so that production didn't get behind schedule as well. That said, when they looked at the footage of Mariska Hargitay as Dulcea, a capable and brilliant actor, it just wasn't quite right. And as it turns out, Fitzpatrick had recovered over the holiday break and was available again, so Spicer and company decided that the best move was to go ahead and reshoot everything they had already shot with Mariska Hargitay as Dulcea, again with Fitzpatrick as Dulcea. As important as Dulcea is in the final film, helping the Power Rangers acquire the great power and thereby their new suits and Zords, saving Zordon, Angel Grove, and the world, she had a much bigger role in the original script. A more robust backstory, training montages, all kinds of stuff, so it makes sense that they wanted to get it right. It's only in hindsight that we can look at it and say that maybe there was a better way to have handled it. We are from the future, where everything seems obvious. The cast found themselves shooting the movie and the TV series at the same time, working around a series of production issues that could have broken the spirit of the entire team. Anthropomorphic rat creatures whose costumes were too simple for the final production had to be replaced with more complex monsters. Scenes that were added after the fact, and after Olsen, the original writer, had already moved on from the film, Ivan Ooze being changed midstream from a character whose main selling point was that he was a shapeshifter, to just being a guy who played a spectrum of personalities, like a purple Robin Williams or a tokusatsu Jim Carrey. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie goes right for every 10-year-old kid's jugular, opening with a scene depicting the Power Rangers sky surfing because it's 1995 and the assumption was that everyone was going to be sky surfing in the future. It was going to change sports and redefine relationships. But it doesn't stop there. The sky surfing seamlessly transitions into inline skating, and the best any kid can do from there is just hold on. Because it's a roller coaster of character introductions, monster makeovers, new ranger powers, and all the cutting edge, computer generated morphing the budget would allow. From Ivan himself to the Tengu warriors to the Temple Guardians on Phaedos. Presumably, one of the benefits of theming everything around Ooze was to take advantage of that morphing technology. That's the name of the thing. This movie should be constantly morphing mightily. That said, the CG on the giant monsters and the new Ninja Megazords looks like early animatics that were never finished. And I'm saying that as someone who sat in the theater and watched it on the day of release. The final Megazord isn't even on model. It doesn't match the toy or the show version from Kaku Ranger. Hard to know if this uber-chrome, low-detail look is what they were intending or if they just ran out of money and time. Hard to know if practical visual effects might have fared better given that there is a scene where the rangers fight a dragon skeleton accomplished with practical visual effects that looks better than all the CG combined. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie was released on June 30th, 1995. It made over $66 million worldwide against a budget of $15 million, which basic math would suggest was a success. It did make money, quite a bit of money. Reviews were mixed with critics on both sides thinking of the children when it came to their reviews. Some said that it was fine. After all, it was just a kid's movie about toys. Others said it was terrible cinema. It's for kids who imagine that this is what it's like to be a cool teenager or a hip young adult, with a positive message that, no matter how extreme the activity, it's never too extreme to wear proper safety protection. Remember, kids, the first thing a hero protects is their knees and elbows. Up against movies like Disney's Pocahontas, Warner Brothers' Batman Forever, and Universal's Apollo 13, it came in fourth, making only $17 million its first weekend. Some saw it as a sign that the power of the Power Rangers was on the decline. Others saw it as a reflection of a production that didn't know what it was doing from the start. Saban and Fox saw it as a missed opportunity to do more creatively, to make more financially. We're in 
Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, the soundtrack has the power to satisfy a range of musical tastes. From the Red Hot Chili Peppers to Van Halen to Dan Hartman to Snaps, I got the power. There's something here for everyone. Like a 90s time capsule trapped in a giant egg for nearly 30 years. A lot of the merchandise released for Power Rangers the Movie was previously existing merchandise with the Power Rangers the Movie logo slapped on it. There were some original releases like the 8-inch scale Ivan Ooze and his two evil space aliens Scorpitan and Hornitor. Previously existing figures like the 5-inch Automorph and Head Flip and Quick Change figures were re-released with modified sculpts that removed the Head Flip and feature. Re-releases of these superposable 8-inch figures all cast in CG-like chrome. The Rangers' new giant combining robot, the Ninja Megazord and Tommy's Falcon Zord, were both released in the movie branded boxes, as well as non-posable collectible minifigures, a two-pack of the pink and yellow Power Rangers girls with interchangeable outfits and hair that you can style. Finish the collection with the carrying case playset. McDonald's featured a Happy Meal promotional tie-in with 4-inch scale figures and vehicles with the Rangers and their new Ninja Zords. 7-Up ran a contest with 1,000 Power Rangers movie power packs with over $500 in new merchandise. $500?! Jell-O featured the Rangers on their packaging. Fleer released a series of trading cards. And there was even a thing called an Ivan Ooze Knuckle Extruder. One push and Ivan's head oozes globs of grossness. Hey, don't blame me. I just work here. More recently, Hasbro, the current owner of the Power Rangers franchise, has released Tenga Warriors and the Rangers in their ninja outfits, featured both in the movie and Season 3. Sega Genesis, Game Gear, Super Nintendo, and Game Boy all got their own different versions of games based on the movie, loosely following the events of Season 2 and the film itself. None of them are ports of each other, so collect them all. Marvel Comics published two different books based on the film, a story adaptation and a photo comic book in September of 1995. Only two alternate covers on the regular comic version. It was 1995, so be thankful that it wasn't worse than that. The movie came home to VHS and Laserdisc in 1995. It would get a re-release on DVD in 2001, then again in 2003. New packaging in 2011 and then again in 2017 to coincide with the release of the newest Power Rangers movie called Power Rangers. In 2018, Shout Factory released it on Blu-ray for the first time as part of their 25th anniversary Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the series DVD steelbook box set. In 2019, they released it on Blu-ray again, this time by itself. As of this video, it is available to stream on HBO Max and varying levels of quality on YouTube. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie was fraught with problems and regrets, but it was by no means the end of the franchise, rather something they could build on. Lessons to learn from. Two years later, the Rangers were back in theaters with another season transitioning film taking place between 1996's Power Rangers Zeo and 1997's Power Rangers Turbo. Directed by David Winning, written by Shuki Levy and Shell Danielson, produced by Saban Entertainment and Toei Company, distributed by 20th Century Fox. It is the second installment in the Power Rangers feature film library, but it is not a sequel to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie. That's not how this works. I will explain. See, there were two seasons of shows between the two movies, so a lot has happened since the first movie for it to be a direct sequel. And the question must be asked with respect to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, is it canon? No! The events of season three, which began airing immediately after the movie, tells a completely different origin story for the Rangers Ninja Mega Powers and Ninja Mega Zords. In the TV version, the Season 2 Thunder Megazords are destroyed by Rita Repulsa's brother, Rito Revolto. The Rangers are sent to the Desert of Despair by Zordon, where they meet Ninjor, who gives them their new powers and Zords. No Dulcia, no Ivan Ooze, the movie could have been considered part of the continuity between June 30th, 1995, the day it was released, and September 2nd, 1995, the day the first episode of Season 3 aired, beginning the new timeline. By the time Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, hit theaters in March of 1997, the events of the first movie have been completely erased. In 2017, a third Power Rangers movie was released, simply called Power Rangers. It didn't even attempt to be part of any established continuity of Power Rangers. It was a full franchise reboot. A new origin story with new designs, new attitudes, and a PG-13 rating. Probably because of all of the violence and that part at the beginning where the Red Ranger j***ed off a bull. It absolutely bombed in theaters, making only $142 million worldwide against a budget of $105 million. But there's still hope for the franchise at the box office as a fourth film is currently in development by Paramount Pictures, Entertainment One, and Netflix. Hopefully this time without jerking off any animals. Mm. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie made plenty of money. It didn't tank the franchise, which is still going on right now. If things had gone smoother, maybe they make some more money in 1995. Maybe they get a few more movies out of it. Either way, an entire generation of kids grew up loving it and the decades of Power Rangers adventures that followed.
More than anything, it reflected the love of the franchise just two years in, here in the US and all the way on the other side of the world in Australia. Power Rangers in a very short time conquered the pop culture world, changed the toy industry, and established a foundation that would last for decades to come. That's the end. Thanks for watching. You can go home now. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Check us out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash toygalaxy if you're in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. And let us know in the comments down below if you saw the Power Rangers movie in the theater or later sitting at home at some point between 1995 and today. I did see it in theaters, despite the fact that I had not actually been watching the series. More of a morbid curiosity thing, given my awareness of Super Sentai and the weirdness of Power Rangers being the conduit for all of that in the US. I can't say that I was disappointed with the movie when I saw it at 19 years old. It certainly was exactly what I was expecting it to be. And yeah, I guess thinking about it now, that was disappointing after all. <laughs> <laughs> God.